For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already, because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. And all God's people said, Amen. Well, good morning. Good morning. It's good to see all of you here this morning as we celebrate uh, Palm Sunday in preparation of the celebration of the resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It's good to see all of you here today. And if you're watching at home uh, via Facebook, we're, we're glad that you're with us. Welcome to our worship service this morning. Uh, we're going to take a real quick look at uh, announcements that we have before we begin our service. Uh, we have choir practice Wednesday night at 7. Good Friday service is April 2nd, Friday at 7 p.m. Make that 7.30 p.m. Easter service next Sunday, Men Alive on the 7th at 7 a.m. at Granny Schaefer's Crossline Ministries distribution that day from 10 to 2. And executive board meets um, April 12th at 6 p.m. Uh, there's information there about the uh, Good Friday in-person and Facebook live service on Friday, April 7th, April 2nd at 7.30 p.m. You can refer to um, your bulletin. So at this point, I'd like Matt Lambeth to come forward for the Lent reading and diminishing light ceremony. Matt. We have gathered here week after week, sharing a common quest for a deeper faith and a deeper experience of the divine. I invite you now to close your eyes and let go of the things that distract and concern you. Listen, the time is drawing near. Jesus is preparing to enter Jerusalem. How will we greet him? Will we follow him all the way to the cross? The power of Jesus is that he lived what he taught, even when it led to his death. He lived with an abiding awareness of God, radiating the light of God in all he said and did. But that light was too much for the world. There are forces today, as there were in ancient Judea, <clears throat> that conspire to put it out. Where are we in this drama? What are we willing to risk to follow Jesus? Let us pray. Loving God, there are so many choices before us every day. Choices offered by our friends, our families, our culture, our own past. Some of them encourage the well-being of the earth, ourselves, and our neighbors. Others are destructive. Help us to distinguish between them. May we learn from the choices of Jesus and embody compassion, justice, and inclusion in all we say and do. Amen. Now, if you're able, would you please stand as we begin with our opening hymn this morning, found on page 278 of our hymnals, Hosanna, Loud Hosanna, page 278.
our joys and concerns this morning. Have a joy on the connection card from Terry Nations. It's good to have you this is with us this morning, Terry. So thank you for the thoughts, prayers, and concerns with his recent illness. Uh, another joy is the fact that all of the blessings that we enjoy in life, no matter how little, no matter how big, come from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Uh, prayers this morning, we lift up the Martha Clifton family, and we lift up the Cecile Woodmancy family as they deal uh, with the loss of their loved one today. And then other names that we have this morning that we lift up, Joanne Cook, or Joan Cook, Sharon Herbison, Steve Holt, Jan Johnson, we lift up Fred Martino, Mark Meredith, uh, Mike Moss, Allie Moss, Terry Nations, Carol Otts, Wade Payne. We lift up Frankie Pyle this morning, Rebecca Steubing, Sonia Terry, Reverend Stephen Wilson, Brenda Yates, and Keith Zorn. Remember these people in your prayers today and for the coming days ahead. We also lift up the people in Atlanta, Georgia, in Boulder, Colorado, and uh, Virginia Beach as they deal with the tragedies there and also those in the southeast that were dealing with horrific storms. Continue to ask for prayers for our nation, um, and the Lord will intervene. Healing for those who are affected by the COVID-19 virus. We lift up anyone who's affected by COVID-19, whether it's uh, the illness or the families dealing with it or the frontline workers who continue to put themselves on the front line um, to deal with that. We ask for prayers for those that are unspoken this morning. We know there are many, and we ask you to remember those unspoken prayers. The Lord knows those prayers, but we can lift them up. Let's join our hearts together in prayer. O oh, merciful God, teach us to fast. Lord, we praise your name because you have given us an, an extreme amount of courage and life and love. Lord, teach us to do those things that are necessary to keep us as disciples of Christ, helping those who need help, providing courage to those who need it, providing a helping hand to those who are hungry and thirsty. Lord, give us strength to resist our greed and patience, to withstand our passing needs. Help us to stand in solidarity with those who don't get to choose. And help us to be hungry for the right things, for righteousness and for justice and for peace. Faithful God, teach us to pray. Give us grace to sit still in silence and in solitude so that you may speak to our hearts. Help us to value time with you above all other time. And show us how to find and keep a routine and a, a pattern of life so that you are the ebb and flow of every thought and every word and every deed that we have. O oh, generous God, teach us to give money away as you have invested your whole destiny in us. Let our giving reflect our gratitude and our longing to be like you. Show us the person and the institution and the cause to which you will us to be bound by bonds of finance and affection. Truthful God, teach us to examine ourselves during this season of Lent. Search inside our hearts and take away those things you don't, that don't belong there. Help us to search inside your heart and put the things we find there inside of our own, locked away but then given to others in freedom. Revealing God, teach us to read your holy scriptures. Show us the parts of your story we forget 
and open to us the aspects of your purposes that we sometimes fail to comprehend. Make your word a lantern to our feet and a light unto our path. Reconciling God, come and heal our broken relationships, our broken hearts. This Lent, show us one enemy who can become a friend. And introduce to us a stranger who opens to us a window into your kingdom. Most loving God, who have, has ever heard of such love that you give? Jesus, whose hands offered justice and mercy, were pierced. Jesus, whose footsteps crossed lines of suspicion and hatred, pierced. Jesus, whose bowed head gathered all in love, pierced and broken. O oh God, may our lives be as dear to us as it is to Christ. May such love be the next person that we see, binding each one of us to each other. May it be so, may it be so, as we pray in the name of Jesus, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Again, if you are able this morning, please turn in your hymnals to 277 as we stand. As we sing, tell me the stories of Jesus, page 277.
Our scripture lesson this morning for text is taken from Mark 11, reading chapter, uh, verses 1 through 11. When Jesus and his followers approached Jerusalem, they came to Bethphage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives. Jesus gave two disciples a task, saying to them, Go into the village over there, and as soon as you enter it, you will find tied up there a colt that no one has ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone says to you, Why are you doing this? Say, Its master needs it, and he will send it back right away. They went and found a colt tied to a gate outside on the street, and they untied it. Some people standing around said to them, What are you doing, untying that colt? And they told them just what Jesus said, and they left them alone. They brought the colt to Jesus and threw their clothes upon it, and he sat on it. Many people spread out their clothes on the road, while others spread branches cut from the fields. And those in front of him and those following were shouting, shouting, Hosanna, blessings on the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessings on the coming kingdom of our ancestor David. Hosanna in the highest. Jesus entered Jerusalem and went into the temple. After he looked around at everything, because it was already late in the evening, he returned to Bethany with the twelve. May God add his blessings to the reading of his word this morning. I could have just imagined what those two disciples were thinking. Probably they thought as they entered into that town that they were going to get maybe a ticker tape parade type celebration. Maybe the one like Douglas MacArthur got in 1951 when he came back from Korea. If you look at pictures back then, the streets in New York were just fill with paper and ticker tapes and it looked like a snowstorm. Or maybe John Glenn in 1962 after he came back from orbiting the, the earth and the heavens and he came back, same thing. You saw nothing but white from paper dumped out of windows, ticker tapes, the whole thing. A hero's welcome. Or I think maybe they would have settled for a ticker tape parade that Douglas Wrong Way Corrigan had in 1938. Now this poor chap, he had been trying to cross the Atlantic in one trip uh, for years and he had been denied permission. They said, no, you can, you know, you can move around, fly anywhere you want in, as long as there's land underneath you. But when you go across the ocean, we're not approving that. He got no permission to do that. Well, one morning he got up and got in his plane, filled all the tanks up, and, and he was supposed to be going to Los Angeles. But somehow he just happened to get turned around in the fog and he claimed that his compass was broken. He wound up in Dublin hours and hours later, the first man to cross uh, the Atlantic like that. And he came back to a ticker tape parade. But no, these two disciples, they imagined a grander and a nobler undertaking when they went into town. And what did they get left with? They got left with donkey detail. You know, Jesus said, hey, go fetch me a, a colt from the stable over there. They were probably thinking, I left fishing and my nets and my boats for this. Now, as Jesus was about to enter the Mount of Olives to get into Jerusalem, Mark reports, he dispatches two of these disciples to fetch him a colt. Now, it seemed like to us, that's a minor detail. You know, we thought, we read Mark and we think, well, this is, you know, typical. You know, Jesus walked everywhere. The disciples walked everywhere they went. But it seems like in Mark's gospel, over half of this little story was occupied with these mundane details about acquiring this animal. 
where to go find it. You know, what do they do when they get there? What kind of cult were they supposed to pick up? What to do and what to say in detail. Now, though no one knows what these two disciples were thinking, I'm fairly confident that they imagined for themselves a grander and a nobler detail for that day. Now, Mark doesn't name these two disciples, but maybe, just maybe, we can use our, our imagination here. You know, the Bible leaves a lot of parts out, and so it's left for us to fill in the blanks. So maybe the two that were closest to Jesus, you know, they followed him all around really close, James and John. You know, these are the two who had just a few hours before asked Jesus, grant us to sit on your right hand and at your left hand in your glory. And maybe Jesus said, okay, you want a glorious detail. Let's put you on the stable duty and you'll get this coat for me. But it really doesn't matter who these two were. But all of the disciples were jockeying for an advantage at that time, angling for glory, trying to find a corner, arguing among themselves who was the greatest. So it's very ironic on this very public and very glorious day in Jesus' ministry that when he was welcomed into Jerusalem with joyous hosanna, palm branches waving everywhere, that they would find them, that these two found themselves in the most unromantic form of ministry, walking around ankle deep in whatever you find in a horse stall or a pen, looking suspiciously like horse thieves, trying to wrestle an untamed and no doubt a bulky and wild animal toward the olive groves. For this, they left their fishing nets so why does Mark allow this donkey-seeking activity even to come across uh, this story? In the Gospel of John, by contrast, Jesus begins his entry in Jerusalem on foot. The donkey only enters the picture a little bit later, a little afterward, when the crowd gets caught up in a palm-waving, nationalistic, king-admiring zeal. At that point, Jesus finds the donkey on his own and he sits on it, just as if to say, hey, I'm not the kind of a king that you're expecting. I'm not gonna roll in here on a carriage full of, pulled by nice horses and with palm branches waving. He said, no, I'm gonna come in a different way. I'm gonna come in in one of the most inglorious ways that I can on the back of a little donkey. And so Jesus did this in kind of a dramatic gesture, a beautiful symbol of his humility in the face of triumphalistic misunderstanding. But in Mark, finding the donkey seems more like a delegated chore. Now in the ordination ceremonies of, of most mainline denominations, they're very, very elaborate. You know, Thomas Long, who is a, a theologian and an author, he, was, he is a, a Presbyterian. And he says that when in his ministry ordination, it goes something like this. Will you in your own life seek to follow the Lord Jesus Christ, love your neighbors, and work for the reconciliation of the world? Will you seek to serve people with energy, intelligence, imagination, and love? Now these are the kind of words that brush through your hair and make you stand up and pay attention. I was told by an Episcopalian friend of mine at his ordination, there was a lot of pomp and circumstance. There was a lot of beautiful hymns. And at the end, he knelt down and he kissed a rock that they brought in, a little flat plate of rock. And he kissed that rock as a symbol of his humility and his uh, awesome, solemn responsibility to serve the least and the lost. Such language implies that ministry is a, a brave whitewater romp over the cultural rapids toward global transformation in the name of Jesus. Never once is it mentioned that serving people with energy, imagination, and love often boils down to stuff like ordering bulletin covers, 
changing light bulbs in the bathroom, visiting people in the nursing home who may or may not know who you are, and getting the brakes relined maybe on the church van, or maybe ordering palm branches at the last minute from the florist. Now, we don't have to worry about that because Kim's in charge of that, and she doesn't miss a detail. <laughs> but it is right at this place, though, that Mark tells us some of the best theological wisdom that was ever offered to humankind. He begins his gospel with the exhilarating trumpet call to prepare the way of the Lord. But he makes it clear by the description of the disciples' activity uh, that the way to do so is not becoming a member of a club somewhere, gallantly defending the cause of Christ, but rather by performing humble and routine tasks, things that nobody ever sees. The disciples in Mark get a boat ready for Jesus. They find out how much food is on hand when they uh, go to feed the multitude, secure the room and prepare the Last Supper, and of course, chase down a wild donkey that the Lord needs to enter into Jerusalem. What are they may have heard when Jesus beckoned, follow me, they didn't know it was gonna lead them into a ministry of handing out the gritty details of everyday life. The, arrange the arrangement people made for the ministry of Jesus, one could hardly ask for a more apt description of what the disciples back then and we are to do. You know, this cuts a couple of ways. On one hand, you're called to prepare the way for Jesus' ministry, and it is his ministry, not ours, not theirs, that ultimately counts. We are just basically donkey fetchers. And on the other hand, because we are in ways hidden from our eyes, Sometimes these routine and exhausting details of our service are gathered into one great big arc of Jesus' redemptive work in the world. In Mark, the twelve are sent out to proclaim the gospel, cast out demons, heal the sick, and exercise authority. But Mark wants us to know that what this looks like often is a matter of speaking a quiet word to someone spending time with someone who is incoherent and maybe coming apart at the seams. In Mark's world, preparing the way for the Lord looks like standing knee deep in the mire of a stable trying to corral a donkey for him. John Stendhal, who is a Swedish theologian and pastor with the Evangelical Lutheran Church, says this, the signature test an image of Advent, not Lent, but Advent in the Swedish childhood that he grew up in, was the entry of Jesus into Jerusalem. The crowds and the Psalms and the Hosannas didn't belong to Holy Week's darkening narrative. And it is in America, it's, this is a dark week coming up on us. In a lighter, more hopeful key, they were also part of the ash, outset of a new church year kind of like what we do in November in Advent. We too are welcoming Jesus and he was coming to us again on a borrowed donkey. We are glad to greet him and God is giving us a new chance to receive him the right way this time. The story again for us begins and we rose to this challenge with hope. Though the Advent use of this entry text has disappeared from our current uh, lectionaries and habits, it still kind of lingers here and there in the hymns that we sing and we read and pray from. It is also not far from the themes of the lessons that we read today. It connects to the stirring excitement of hope in the prophet's words and in the promise of the psalm. In the second lesson, the apostle describes the waiting for the Lord's coming, not as a cause for fatigue, despair, but as a gracious forbearance, a gift of time to ready ourselves. 
And at last the voice calls out in the wilderness, preparing the way for someone who comes. A new age begins with cleansing and in promise, the gift of the Holy Spirit after the flames. So to begin at the beginning is to find that we are not prisoners of the past. John the Baptist announced as much. We and our blessed and sometimes foolish land need not to be bound to our idolatries or to our regrets, our greeds or our fears, but we can begin again. This is not just a prelude. It is also part of what it anticipates for us. The good news of Jesus was already at work in this expectancy and this preparation, even preparation of getting a donkey out of a stall. It's the beginning of the beginning. So to us today, we may ask ourselves, is this still so? Amen. Before I introduce our uh, offertory music this morning, I would like to ask you to enter into prayer, be prayerfully mindful of the ongoing ministry of Central United Methodist Church and ongoing expenses. And we encourage you to continue your tithes and your offerings. There are boxes at the back, since we no longer pass the plates as our custom, uh, there are boxes at the back of the church. You can put those in. Uh, there's a lock box on the side the entrance from the parking lot. Uh, you can mail it into the office or you can uh, go to our Facebook page, not, excuse me, our website, and there is a mechanism there to give online. And just uh, prayerfully consider that, if you would, please. And we'll be having a special birthday celebration in just a little bit. But this morning, our special offertory music is presented by Craig Smith, entitled All Glory, Laud, and Honor. thank you for that great solo and um, my father-in-law is here today Howard Rooker is right here and he is 90 years old you may not have known this but we are we have the same birthdays and uh, you know we're, I'm just glad that he's able to come up here with us today and uh, yesterday actually and celebrate birthdays and, and we had a big time yesterday didn't we Howard all right well um, his granddaughter and my niece, Olivia Rooker Wellhoff, would like to come and give you a blessing. All right? Good morning. Dear Heavenly Father, we celebrate with you the 90th birthday 
of my grandfather, Howard Rooker, one of your own who has lived long and well. Thank you that he has journeyed through so many ages and stages of life, cultivating the gifts of wisdom, persistence, and dependence on you. We affirm the joy and wonder of your word in the scripture that says, gray hair is a crown of splendor. It is attained by a righteous life. Proverbs 16, 31. We pray that you will continue to grant vigor, strength, and health this day and on all of his birthdays to come. Bless his days with beautiful memories, joy, peace, and health that comes with a life well lived. Be his constant companion when family and friends are far away. Bless him abundantly as he has blessed us with his grace, perspective, and love. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. birthday. Now, if you're able, please stand as we turn in our hymnals to uh, one of my favorites, and I'm sure one of yours as well, How Great Thou Art, found on page 77. We'll sing verses 1 through 3, page 77.
Jerry, would you and Paula come stand up here with me in the front?